New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Harold Pinta has been called Britain's greatest living playwright. He has written 29 plays, 24 screenplays, and innumerable essays and poems. He has written for radio and for television. It is difficult to measure this man's contribution to modern drama. But we know this. He revolutionized the theatrical experience. His mastery of the written word, of paring down the English language to its most essential and powerful components, has been recognized by all. His eloquent, insightful confrontation of some of the darkest themes of modern existence has rarely been matched. He has been as well an aggressive citizen, participating in the great public debates of his time, never more engaged as in his strong opposition to the Iraq War. Well, there are one or two words left to be said, as a matter of fact. <laughs> one is resistance, which is embodied today in this magnificent gathering and the other I direct precisely to Tony Blair, which is resign, resign, resign. He has received numerous awards for his work, most notably the Nobel Prize in Literature. I have to stop being speechless when I get to Stockholm, apparently. Because of a battle with cancer of the esophagus, he delivered his acceptance speech from London. The lecture was devoted to the creative act, his political passion, and the intersection of the two. I believe that despite the enormous odds which exist, unflinching, unswerving, fierce intellectual determination as citizens to define the real truth of our lives and our societies is a crucial obligation which devolves upon us all. It is in fact mandatory. On January 17, 2006, the Prime Minister of France, Dominique de Vopin, came to London to present one more honor, La Légion d'Honneur. Harold Pinter, who began his career as an actor using the name David Barron, has performed often on the stage. In October 2006, despite his age and his battle with cancer, he made a triumphant return in Samuel Beckett's one-man play, Crap's Last Tape. His performance was called Beyond Acting by The New York Times, a coming together that is more than just a performance, a moment of theater history. Crap's last tape, you came back to the theater. Why did you do that? Well, I finally couldn't resist it. <laughs> I wasn't. I'd been quite ill. And I said I didn't think I'd have the energy to do it. But Ian Rickson, the director of the Royal Court, is retiring now from that position, and my wife, um, kept going at me very gently mm -hmm. and said, don't say no, finally. And so, finally, I said yes. It is said to be made for you. A, it's your friend, Samuel Beckett. B, it's an older man looking back when he was 39 from yeah. Voices on Tape. Uh, his own voice, yeah. Did you feel natural in those words? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they seem to be... Uh, Seemed to fit me pretty well, actually. How so? Well, I'm 76. In fact, I'm older than crap. Yes. Uh, he's 69. But I can pretend to be 69. <laughs> it's not, there's not much difference. Yeah, what the hell. <laughs> and um, I, I have my memories, as they say. Yeah. And I did indeed know Samuel Beckett pretty well. I was very... Um, we were close friends. And so I was really very excited by the idea of doing, actually acting in one of his plays, which I have never done. Indeed, it is intriguing that this performance was the first ever collaboration between two of the greatest playwrights of the second half of the 20th century, good friends and fellow cricket lovers, both recipients of the Nobel Prize in Literature, Beckett in 1969 and Penner in 2005, both known for their mastery of language both coming from the absurdist tradition, and both considered to have had profound impact. In Crap's last tape, they are joined for the first time, and perhaps the last. This may well be Pinter's final performance on stage, as he talked to me in our interview. So I, my only regret is that he wasn't here to see it, because I think he would have found it um, 
worthwhile, I, I do really. Because I think what I did, just speaking quite objectively, is that I, there was not an ounce of sentimentality in these memories. It was very hard and pretty remorseless. Um, and I think finally pretty poignant, very lonely play. But there was also a great deal of anger, I found, in the part. And that suited me very well. Anger about what? Wasted life. That's what... Um, I'm not angry about my wasted no, life. No, but because, his life. Because I haven't wasted my life. At all? I don't think so. 29 plays, television, film. Yeah, 20 films. Poems. Uh, there is this, though. He says, I have lived my life... I don't have any desire to go back. You feel the same way? I don't believe that he means that. The character. I believe he really would like to go back and live again. He's, he's, he's playing with the idea and then discards it. Um, it's, a, it's a play of despair, but of course of great, great regret. So... Um, Pretty good. It's also a few laughs in it. It, it is. I, do you have no regrets? Or a few? You. Yes, of course I have regrets. About this, that, and the other. Is it things you did or didn't do? Not so much to do with what I did, but what I... My first family was a very... Finally, a very unhappy experience, which was very, very sad. Um, my first wife died very young, really, in her 50s. And, um, and my son and I are estranged and haven't spoken for about 13 years. So those, both those things are sad. And I regret that they, A, they happened the way they did and be the way things are, the way they are in those respects. I'm talking now about my son, of course. Um, but at the same time, I've been very happily married, to put it mildly, for, uh, well, I've been with my, with Antonio Fraser for 31 years. And um, that's meant everything to me. Peril Penta's wife is Lady Antonia Fraser. She is the daughter of Lord Frank Pockenham and former wife of Scottish MP Sir Hugh Fraser. She is a best-selling author of historical biographies, including the acclaimed Mary, Queen of Scots. They were married in 1980 after a highly publicized relationship. And here is a look at a conversation she and I had about her husband earlier this year. When I was first with Harold, <laughs> I wrote a play, yes. and he was very supportive. And every reviewer said, not as good as Harold Pinter's, including the ones who hated Harold's work. And I said, I shall write another play, and Harold said, you go on, but I never did. Yeah. Of course, I think, how can Harold ever really give a reaction and leave the dramatist out of it? He doesn't think that he's uh, making a critique as a dramatist, but he has, off, after all, a tremendous sense of drama. So if he says, and I don't want him to be thought of as endlessly nitpicking, he, he gives a comment when asked, as it were. Um, <laughs> yes. And yes. I mean, if he says he thinks that something's not c quite working, I take that very seriously. Well, you give it to him for comment, do you yes, not? Yes, I, I mean, do. that's the point. I mean, you're... But, uh, Charlie, I mean, in one sense, there's only one comment we all want, isn't it? Which Marvelous. is, well done, yes. my dear. Yeah. <laughs> You have said I could not have gone through the disease that I am fighting without her at no, my that, side. Well, that, that's happened twice. That's quite true, by the way. I couldn't have made it without her. What is it she brings? Well, she brings tremendous spirit, tremendous strength, and love. Um, because I've been very close to death since I last saw you yes. twice. Um, and um, they were quite some experiences, in both cases. And she was right there as a rock all, all the time, although she suffered terribly. I was within an inch of going down the drain on both occasions. You have said no more plays. Yes, there won't be any more plays. 29 is enough. Enough, enough, to, yes. <laughs> I think a lot of people would be very relieved about that. Anyway. But you also said, well, why do you think they would be relieved? Let me tell you a story. I came here from the hotel to this theater 
And the taxi driver said, uh, did you have a nice day? I said, yes. He said, where are you from? I said, New York. He said, what are you doing in London? I said, I'm going over to Ovid to interview Harold Pinter. He said, this taxi driver who lived in London all his life, he said, I loved, I think he said, the birthday party. Uh -huh. And I thought, what a great thing for him to say. I mean, you have said you don't, you know, you, you are, you're writing for yourself and not for the audience. But here was somebody that it resonated after all those years. Well, that's, I'm very, very touched to hear that and very pleased. But there's the, I mean, some people do like my work and other people really don't. I have a story on the other side of the coin. All right, tell me. For example, when I went to see a production of my play No Man's Land with Gielgud and Richardson many years ago, I went into the bar in the interval <laughs> and found myself in a corner <laughs> and there were a man and a woman. I couldn't escape, you know. They, stand, they stood in dead silence for a while and then the man said, oh well, not as boring as the usual pinter, I suppose. <laughs> So there's, um, you know, have the two sides of the coin. Here is what the Nobel Committee said of his achievement. Pinter restored theater to its basic elements and enclosed space and unpredictable dialogue where people are at the mercy of one another and pretense crumbles. Do you feel like you brought something to the theater that was not there, that you, in, in those plays that began in the 50s uh, and continued up until the last? No, I would make no claims for my work on any such basis. Um, any such achievement, I have literally no idea whether I brought something new to the theatre. Other people have said something to that effect. Pinter himself is reticent when it comes to his place in modern theatre, not so his contemporaries. To many of them, Harold Pinter remains one of the most significant dramatists of our time. He has made his own way of seeing the world, seeing um, drama, actually, and seeing human relationships and all that tech stuff. He, he, he's, he's made uh, an awful lot of people come around and see things the way that he sees them. Uh, there's also Harold Pinter, the polemicist, and something else, too. Uh, I'm, I'm very fond of him. Um, and uh, after many, many years, just, just a little in awe of him. Harold has been hugely influential. You know, you could say to a fault. It's not his fault, but every young writer who writes now writes with Harold's ear. They write dialogue that sounds like Harold's dialogue. They write plays of people trapped, not able to communicate. You know, Harold has been massively influential. He and Beckett in, in 20th century uh, uh, English literature took the narration out of drama and they put the poetry back. That's no small achievement. No, it's a great achievement. It's spectacular. Pinter infused his love into poetry, into the poetry of the theater. And uh, his sense of humor and his bitterness and his um, um, just sexual outrageousness and perversity, he all put into these uh, strangely bright colors in the theater. For me, he stands alone. I mean, he is he's the great 20th century European playwright long, alongside Samuel Beckett, for me. Um, I, I can't think of anyone else that has actually changed the way we speak um, and the way we write and the way we understand dialogue in the way that Harold has. I'm Harold Pinter is somebody I admire uh, tremendously and in a, uh, a very particular way. He, I have previously said about the Rolling Stones that a few things move me to patriotism. Um, one of them is the Rolling Stones, the other is Harold Pinter. Harold Pinter makes me proud to be English. What of the things that have been said resonated most with you? Well, as opposed to the view of the man in the bar, yes. that, that there's a sense of excitement about my work on the stage, and um, I hope that is the case. And I hope that remains the case. Um, and I find when, it, when it's good, it's good. I mean, when the actors are good and the director is good, um, I do, I must say, myself derive a great sense of uh, excitement about the whole thing. Have you, have you watched a play that you have written 
and the production of it was better than was what was in your mind no. when you wrote it? Never. I, quite the opposite, really. <laughs> The other thing people say a lot about you is that, in a sense, there's a direct line from Beckett to Pinter, and from Pinter to Stoppard and others. Well, you know, you don't um, live in a vacuum as a writer. I I've read a great deal in my life. One of the people I certainly read way back in um, about 50 years ago was Beckett, and he left a great impression on me. Uh, I was writing at the time myself, but um, nevertheless, I wouldn't dream of denying that people like Beckett, Kafka, Joyce, um, Dostoevsky uh, left great imprints on one's very being, um, so that... Uh, Was it the power of language that did, that did it in the end, just the power of their capacity? Well, not only the power, yes, certainly the power of language, but also vision a certain vision of life on Earth, which I thought, in all those cases I've just mentioned, was singular um, and very, very personal. And um, I think I probably got some kind of vision myself, but I couldn't define it. Why did you never perform in a Beckett play? Well, because I was too shy, I think. Too much of a responsibility. Because I don't think many people know, you. first 10 years of your sort of adult life were more as an actor than a playwright. Oh, yes, but I've been, I've been acting ever since. Ever since. Huh? Yeah. Um, this is my, I think this is my last tape, though. This performance. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, a, uh, um, when, when you act, does it give you insight into what you write because you are more in command of what the theater feels from the other side? I mean, when I'm acting one of my own plays. Yeah. Do you learn from? Yes, I do. I think you, uh, there's no question about that pick up, I pick up things. I'm illuminated by speaking the words aloud, you know, by hearing them and realizing um, something that I hadn't perhaps appreciated before while writing them. Um, there's a great difference of moving about a stage. There's a great difference between sitting at a desk, writing, and moving about a stage, acting, when you're inhabiting the same uh, world. The same world. Yeah, but but I would think that you would read these same words out loud and move about as you were writing them. I mean, that would be part of the writing process, not just to sit at a desk, because you know, the theater uh, is well, and the stage is an animated place. Yes, I'm, it certainly animated my life, and I. Um, but I can't. The image of me walking around the room, spouting my own <laughs> words. Um, it's not quite accurate. Yeah. Next time I do it, I have to come and have I'll come and be there with the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you could write what you write and not have a, a, a very realistic sense of who you are and what you have done and what talents you have. Is it just modesty? Is it just... I can't make any such judgment, you know, in my own work. I only know... The one thing I really do know about my own work is that it makes me laugh. Um, I really do get a lot of laughs out of it. And um, when I hear other uh, actors s saying the lines, I, I join in their own relish. You would rather write a, li write a line that generates a laugh than some piercing insight? No, I believe in two things. One is get a laugh if it's a natural laugh. And the other is, stop it. <laughs> Dead. I, by moving to the next... Yes, by shutting yeah. the audience up. I've always found the audience a kind of contest between myself and the audience, as I would like. And I've enjoyed that contest. Mm -hmm. There are, it is and said... there's only one winner. <laughs> either, either the audience wins or you win. It has to be me. For you, it has to be you. Yeah, sure. There have been times in which, on stage, you can feel the contest. Very much so. I had a most memorable, unforgettable uh, night in New York many years ago with the homecoming yeah. when the lights went up on the first night, the opening night. The audience hated it immediately. They saw the set, they saw the actors dressed in an unappealing way, and they detested it. And there was a tremendous contest that night in which the actors detested the audience as much as the audience detested them. And finally, the actors won 
and the audience, you know, their bow ties and their mink coats, slumped in their seats, defeated. And was that performance that night better than it had been before? Yeah, it's a great performance. Because they rose to the occasion. They certainly did. Yeah. In the Nobel speech, Pinner talked about truth and falsehood and his approach to the intersection between the two as an artist and as a citizen. In 1958, I wrote the following. There are no hard distinctions between what is real and what is unreal, nor between what is true and what is false. A thing is not necessarily either true or false. It can be both true and false. I believe that these assertions still make sense and do still apply to the exploration of reality through art. So, as a writer, I stand by them. But as a citizen, I cannot. As a citizen, I must ask, what is true? What is false? In a work of art, a thing is not necessarily either true or false. It can be both true and false at the right, same time. Right. It's very complex, the examination of reality through art. But as a citizen, this is like what I went on to say, these, uh, this does not apply. As a citizen, I want to know and need to know what is true and what is false. It's a responsibility that I feel devolves upon me as a citizen of this country and a citizen of the world between to discern what is a lie and what is true. Which brings me to the Iraq war. All right. <laughs> Let me, before I go to there, because I want to go there with you. Okay. Um, and, and it, some will have said about your life that when you escape London at the time of the bombing, uh -huh. did the bombings have a significant impact on you they at all? They certainly did. And how did it shape the way you feel and think? Well, I realized what a bomb was. I was under bombs. When you're under a bomb, um, when you see a whole, this is going back to 1940, that's over 60 right. years ago, 66 years ago. Um, when you look out your house and see a whole street gone, then 66 years ago with high explosive bombs from German planes, you realize that the power now of such bombs is infinitely greater than it was then. And therefore you have a very acute realization of what bombs actually do. They not only kill people, they dis the destruction, uh, of the, the power of these weapons is quite enormous. Um, and what it does to people's uh, sensibilities what it does to their minds, quite apart from what it does to their bodies, is never-ending, you know, can, can hardly be measured. And I'm going to say, Charlie, that I think that this is the great abyss that exists between what our politicians um, say and what actually happens. Because I don't think that death is recognised by the, the leaders of our free world, you know. The words death don't apply. You know, there's no body count in Iraq. Nobody knows how many people have been killed. Um, even the American soldiers who have been killed, 3,000 of them, are kept under wraps. As for the mutilated Americans I'm talking about at the moment, um, they are mutilated for life. Again, countless thousands of people, not referred to. Ashamed. They're ashamed and they, of this fact. And they don't, it's more than being ashamed, they don't want to, they cannot recognise the reality of what war is, of what bombs do, of what missiles do. It is impossible to talk about Harold Pinter, the artist, without touching on Harold Pinter, the political activist. For some, his political beliefs have become as noteworthy as his literature, and a few suggest that he received the Nobel Prize in part for his political beliefs. Pinter feels that the expression of his views is not only appropriate, but his duty. How many people do you have to kill before you qualify to be described as a mass murderer and a war criminal? 100,000. More than enough, I would have thought. 
Therefore, it is just that Bush and Blair be arraigned before the International Criminal Court of Justice. And as he does in almost every interview, he literally rips the bark off the tree. Are you simply saying if the leaders of the United States understood what war does to a people, they would not, for any reason, launch a war? This is something that is simply not addressed, I contend, by our leaders. It is not really addressed because the language they use, which is, for example, your president saying, victory is what we're looking at and victory is what we're going to get. My prime minister, a pathetic man in my view, says over in Iraq only the other day, he said, we're going to stay until the job is done. Now look at that, that, that language. What job? What well, are they, they talking about? They perceive the job is done, uh, that they have to say to, in their eyes, uh, that there is uh, terrorism in the world. Well, I think a lot of people would um, contend that the terrorists are George Bush and Tony Blair. Is there a moral equivalency there for you that, that goes to either side? There aren't, there aren't two sides. Um, we're creating, in Iraq, there are two di different, separate points, it seems to me. One is the invasion of Iraq, right. and the other is this general war against terror. Neither can ever be won. Okay. Let me go back for you and I to the central thesis, though, the idea that we were talking about. If leaders understood what war does, they wouldn't wage war. And especially that's applicable in Iraq, you said. I mean, I, does this... No, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't intend to say that, that they wouldn't wage war. They will always wage war. Look, a country of the United States is under a military footing, permanent military footing. It's the biggest, most powerful military force the world has ever known. Now, and it's very, very good for business, for the armaments manufacturers, for example. Uh, the, the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower himself said many years ago. You and I differ about your view of America, as, as we might, but let me, <clears throat> let me stay with the idea. Bill Clinton was president of the United States. The, the complex was still there, and the only, uh, the, he uh, also attacked. He uh, did indeed. He did indeed. Uh, he was no different than George Bush. It's just a question of... It's a question of, of degree. Degree. Every American leader. The last time we spoke... Says, which was in early 2001 or right. summer of 2001. Yeah, exactly. Um, we were talking about the bombing of Serbia, I right? Right. remember, which was Clinton. Right. And um, I have said this was totally unjustified and unnecessary, that diplomacy could have worked with Milosevic. And you, you questioned, I remember very clearly. I did. You questioned that. And I do believe that diplomacy is the only, it's the last resort that we actually possess, it, particularly in relation, for example, to Iran and its nuclear capacity or whatever. Um, you've got to talk, you know. I'm for talking. I mean, this is not an adversarial thing between you and me, but, I, no. but it is about ideas. I believe in talking. I think Colin Powell believes in talking. Um, a lot of people believe we have not used diplom diplomacy enough. You believe that we are, there is something at the core of the United States about its values, about uh, its... Uh, its mission in the world, how it sees itself, that inevitably leads to something like Iraq. It leads to more than Iraq. It need, leads to um, Guantanamo Bay. It leads to CIA detention centers all over the world. Uh, unknown, actually, not only unknown, but not even hardly referred to, um, not acknowledged. There is an outcry against that by the people of the United States and by other political leaders. Well... So that's not an American trait. That was a decision call, by no. political leaders in power to do something. Now, uh, look, Charlie, you do know that there's something called the Military Commissions Act of 2006. I do. Which technically means that torture is legalized, has been legalized uh, by Congress. But you also know that people like John McCain and Colin Powell... But they're powerless. I they have they no are. power. But, but, but it's not at the core of America is what I'm saying. Well, I mean, it, I'm just saying that, yes, you, these <clears throat> things happened and we are embarrassed by them uh, because we believe, most of us, in the 
Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in human rights, and in due process. Those things. But these, these, um, these things are being betrayed. A political leadership in power at the time made decisions because they assumed a threat that was there and they believed that they had to take those measures. They were wrong, uh, they were secret, and an opposition to them has arisen. Certainly. And when I, um, I must tell you, Charlie, that when I made my Nobel speech, uh, I, part of it was, uh, I was, I think, analyzing and, and describing what I thought but believed to be facts about U.S. foreign policy. Not fantasy, but facts. And which I thought was deplorable and regrettable. And what you believe is the, is the imperative of a citizen. That's right. Well, I just wanted to tell you that I received many letters from everywhere, but a great body of letters from the United States. I'm not surprised. No. That's who we are. But it was very gratifying. It should be. And it was good. I was, you know, really... Of course there, is, there are wonderful uh, aspects of the United States yeah. of America. There's no question about it. And you've had success there and you have lots of friends there. It, that is true. The perception, though, Earl, in part, is that, you know, the most anti-American person in Europe is Harold Pinter. I'm not anti-American. But that's the way it's perceived. They don't say anti-Bush, they say anti-American. Well, tell them they've got it wrong. <laughs> Because I, 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 that's part I'm anti Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and, Blair. and all that lot. And, and Blair. certainly Blair, my God, you can say that again. And you think they should be brought up before the International Court of Justice? Yes, I do. And charged with? Mass murder. Mass murder. Are you, are you saying, let's just, there has been, and it, it, Hitler's too easy. Stalin, the Khmer Rouge. Yeah. Are you making the same moral equivalency between what they did and what George Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld did? You like language and you are precise about language. Right. They clearly, the, the invasion of Iraq has not brought about the death of as many people as Nazi Germany did, or Stalin, or Mao. Or, or even Rouge. the Khmer Rouge. But how many people do you have to kill before you can be described as a mass murderer? Um, I believe we, the United States and the United Kingdom, were responsible for the deaths of at least 100,000 people in Iraq before the insurgency actually began. Now that whole thing has spiraled, and they're still responsible <laughs> for the deaths of further hundreds of thousands. Where of would you put Saddam Hussein in this? Well, he was a tyrant, and there are plenty of tyrants. And a mass world. murderer? Yes. But he didn't kill as many people as we have. What justifies overthrowing a mass murderer? Saddam Hussein. Look. What justifies... They were... We didn't go into Iraq to overthrow a mass murderer. We went into Iraq to assert our United States power in the Middle East and to give it a, a force which is going to be a permanent force. Americans who watch this and hear you would also want to say, how do you feel about the dead of 9-11? How do you feel about the people who went to work that day, had no brief, no grief, uh, and their country was not at war with the people who uh, hijacked planes and drove them into buildings and killed their loved ones? And doesn't America doesn't their government owe it to them to respond? Firstly, that was the most shocking atrocity, without any question. Um, horrific. Um, and of course, it brought about a response. It would naturally bring about a response. And did you but approve response, of that response? No, that's the whole point. How sensible was the response that actually happened? So what would have been an appropriate response, a call up and send a message to Osama bin Laden and say, please don't do that again? <laughs> I think, uh, Charlie, that that terrible, shocking atrocity of 9-11 must be seen against a background 
a context must be seen in context. It didn't come right out of the blue. It came, it was an act, in my view, of retaliation against something. Against what? Against assertions of American military power throughout the world for a very long time. I mean, since the, since the end of the Second World War, for example. Here's what I want from you, a prescription. What do you want us to become? What, what, what is it that you want the United States to become? You want us to end the war in Iraq, take, bring the Americans home, for the British to come home, and allow the Iraqis now to solve their own... Yeah, but I think it's more than that. Okay. I, I tell you, there's one country we haven't referred to at all during this conversation, which is Israel. And I think we, we, the Americans, and as far as it goes, the British, have supported a regime in Israel which becomes more and more authoritarian every day, which has treated the um, Palestinians in the most deplorable way, which will do anything... Yeah, Jimmy Carter is saying that now, well, in his latest book. Well, he would, because he's a very intelligent man. Um, and I think while we have this relationship with, with Israel, while we support... Um, I'm speaking as a, a Jew, by the way, and I deplore what, what Israel is doing. Um, which part do you deplore? Well, the mean, occupation of the West Bank and the... Yes, and also the continual harassment of, of, the, of the Palestinians, the, the humiliation uh, that they bring to their lives, the actual uh, hours and hours that people have spent trying to get to a hospital, trying to get to a school and so on, but are stopped by Israeli soldiers who are actually simply thugs. Now, while we support this regime and don't do anything to... Uh, to uh, in, correct it, then we're bound to come against uh, tremendous antagonism throughout the Middle East, because that is the central issue of the Middle East when it comes down to it. We have now mentioned Israel. Tell me what it is, do you, what kind of government you want to see in the United States? What would it look like? What is it that would make it uh, okay with you? Basically, I think um, the ability to examine itself and the use of its undoubted where that in intelligence actual intelligence resides there must be some really intelligent people knocking about the, the, the white house i take it. well i assume there are yeah there must be yeah of course there. why don't they exert their, that their intelligence why don't they use it to influence uh, the uh, course that the government your government is taking um they don't seem to be doing so well it, 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 well, it, it, is now the, it is now the defining issue of our time in American politics. It is. Well, the question of, of Iraq. The question of Iraq. Yes. Well, you know, I, think I don't think it's too late, and I would hope you wouldn't believe it's too late, because... I think it's mm. just about, perhaps not too late, but what it is, <laughs> we're in a very perilous and precarious situation because of the basic hypocrisy, hypocrisy, of these statements that are made um, by our governments. Now, for example, Iran is looking to get a nuclear bomb. Um, what do you think of that? Wait a minute. Right. The USA has thousands of nuclear weapons, at, at least 2,000 on red alert at this very moment. Who are they pointing to? And how about this? They have had these nuclear weapons and have not exercised or used them at all in a sense, except for... Once. Once. Twice. Yeah, twice. Yeah. Twice in well, Japan. Well, I think we, we all know that they are actually developing uh, new nukes, uh, smaller ones, apparently, which won't yeah. do anybody any harm, apparently. So they say... Well... well um, they develop... That, that system is in operation. The American military, military uh, industrial complex is on, as I said, a permanent military footing. And... Until they look at that and say, now, wait a minute, that's the first thing we do. Just cool it. Let's calm down. Do you have any objection to Iran having a nuclear weapon? I have an objection to everybody having nuclear weapons. Including Iran. And yeah. we should do everything we can to stop them from yeah, doing it. Yeah, and we should do everything we can. We've been going through a moral, political crisis. Why haven't you put the passion and the skill on stage. Why not from an artist, 
whose command of the language and precision is so good, a play that got at these issues. Well, I think I, I have done that. Which one? A number. Um, I've written many of my plays. A lot of the early ones and the late, and the late ones too are about the use of power, the abuse of power. And, um, Mainly between individuals. No, I mean there's more than that. One, one for the road, mountain language, um, party time, um, the, going back to the birthday party, and the dumb waiter, etc. They, they are embodied by individuals. Yes, I mean they're expressed the use of characters. But it is about one's power over the other, yes. and the intrusion of some person or force that causes a alienation and a disequilibrium. One for the Road is a play about torture. And there's a lot of that, there's even more of, of that about these days than there was when I wrote One for the Road. So maybe One for the Road should have been performed on the British stage in the last three years. Well, it's, it's often done, it's all over the world, actually. But have you been tempted to bring... I can't write a play about Iraq. Why? It's not within my... The man I admire, I can't, it's not within my field somehow. Um, because it's a big th the why man who can do that is, is whom I admire very much is David Hay. and has done it yeah why is it beyond your scope why is it your you know David Hare's job to do why is it not Harold Pinter as a writer um, and as a dramatist you approach reality from a number of perspectives like the crystal ball of this world goes around and you're trying to find where the you know, the light is actually falling. Uh, and I, that's the only way I can approach reality is the way I do. Um, David here has a wonderful ability to do it in a much more direct way. I approach it in a, I suppose, in a, in a more um, well, like indirect way. Um, I can't uh, make direct statements on the stage. I can certainly do that on a platform, and I do. On a political platform yeah. where you're making a speech? Yeah. Including your Nobel acceptance speech. That is right. But I can't, I find I haven't got the uh, ability to... Um, I prefer to, to, to do it on the, in, in a play. Anyway... You prefer to do it in a play? No. I, ha I haven't... A, I have not done it like that in a play. No. Right. And B, my, I'm, my writing days are over in play, so I'm afraid. All right, I'm, I'm going to get to the portrait in a moment, but as you know. But, but theater today, are you satisfied with theater today? I think there's lots of very um, good theater around. Um, a lot of very good young writers. I think Colin McPherson is a very, very good writer. And he's, um, and he doesn't write about Iraq, he writes about what's in his vision, what's in his mind, what's in his, how he experiences life. And I think I tend to do the same thing. What is it that has brought you the greatest satisfaction as a work of art from your pen? Well, I'm, uh, it's like, what about the blue tie and the red tie? Well, yes, it's different, is it? You know, I, I mean, they're all the same? I'm, I'm very fond of everything I've written. <laughs> I have to confess. <laughs> no favorites. Uh, and, and are fond of all of them. Yeah. No. You have no favorites? No, well, perhaps I do. Well, tell me. Well, I've always thought The Homecoming was a very well-shaped play. And I'm very happy to say it's going to be done in New York next I year. Know. I know. Um, I'm very pleased about that. It will be the last <clears throat> done in New York in 67, so it will be 50 years. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. When Sam Mendes asked him once about his favorite play, Pinto gave the same answer as he did to me, The Homecoming. Mendes then asked why that was the case. Well, I once asked him why it was his favorite play, and he said, well, it's all a question of shape. And I said, what do you mean by shape? He said, well, it's a particular shape, isn't it? And I said, what shape would that be? And he said, well, it's sh and that's it. <laughs> I've always liked the homecoming, perhaps. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a little more acting on radio here. 
I'm going to play the father in The Homecoming, <laughs> which I've been wanting to do for years, but now I'm the right age. Because the, the plays are what you're best known by, the writing of a play, how do you approach it? Do you look for an incident? You look for what to yeah. get you going? Just an image or a word gets me going. Just what word got you going in The Homecoming? First line. Which was? A man comes into a room, sees that there's another man sitting there. And the man who comes into the room says, what have you done with the scissors? Here is a look at that famous first line in the 1973 film version of The Homecoming, directed by Sir Peter Hall. Here, too, is a look at the use of silence, that pause that has come to characterize his work for many and has become one of the crucial components of the term dedicated to his style, Pinneresque. What are you done with the scissors? I said, I'm looking for the scissors. What have you done with them? Did you hear me? I want to cut something out of the paper. I'm reading the paper. Not that paper. I haven't even read that paper. I'm talking about last Sunday's paper. I was just having a look at it in the kitchen. You hear what I'm saying? I'm talking to you. Where's the scissors? Why don't you shut up, you dull prat? And then the characters take over. They do. And you have said that you have to, it's almost like a dog on a leash. You, ha let, you have to let them go do their thing. Yeah. But you always have to be in control and being able to call them and pull them back. If you could manage it, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's quite a task sometimes. And the joy is you don't know where they're going to go. That is true. Um, it corresponds to my own uh, life. I don't know where I'm going to go either. You don't. <laughs> You've only made one movie as a director. Yeah. Because I don't like getting up early in the morning. Is that what it was? Yeah. You like to write for the film. I mean, you have adapted oh, yes, for the film. French Lieutenant's Woman. Well, I've now Sleuth. 20 films. 20 films. Others. And those are the two that first come to mind. Well, the go-between. The go-between. The, go the Servant. Servant. Mm. What was the appeal of you to take someone else's work and write a screenplay? Well, I always a man have. as good as you are. I'm not demeaning screenwriting, but... Very exciting craft. Is it? Oh, yes. What's exciting about it? What's exciting about it? Yes. Well, to adapt um, a, a novel you admire, which is all I've done, yeah. um, into a, to transpose it into another medium is very challenging and very exciting. I've loved every, everything I've done in film. And, um... Wish you'd done more? No, enough yeah. is enough. You seem to have the, the way you have constructed this life. It seems to me that you look at it back and you, and you look at all the things you have done and you feel, I've got it about right. Now, only one novel, though. Yes. Sorry about that. Why? Why what? Why only one novel? Because I hadn't... I'd, I didn't have it in me to write another one. <laughs> you didn't? No. What was not in you? Well, I was writing. I'm, I mostly write poetry now, as you know. I know. And um, I've written poetry for many, many years. And that gives me great satisfaction, even though very short on the whole. Harold Pinter's poetry has served as an arc for his writing career, the one constant presence as he has succeeded in numerous other media. He began by writing love poems, and now after he has put down his pen as a playwright, he continues to create the poetry that has punctuated the length of his career. For many, poetry remains on par with the dramatic writing. Here is Bill Nye. I love his poetry, um, and I carry his poetry everywhere I go as a kind of antidote to anything else that might happen to me. I like to even, you know, I like to have it with me. You know, he's one of the the, he's one of the great men of the world, and, I, and, and, it, and, it's, and the fact that he's an Englishman makes me is obscurely proud. Here is one, small. Uh -huh. Laughter dies but is never dead. Laughter lies out the back of its head. Laughter laughs at what is never said. It trills and squeals and swills in your head. It trills and squeals in the heads of the dead. 
and so all the lies remain laughingly spread. Sucked in by the laughter of the severed head, sucked in by the mouths of the laughing dead. You read that very well. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that was the last poem I wrote. I know. Mm. November 10th, 2006. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I've always had a, quite a heightened consciousness of, um, about one or two things, like social life and other aspects of our lives. And I was sitting in a bar, in fact. I tell you, do you want to know how I wrote that? <laughs> yes, I do. I was sitting in a bar, and the bar was very close to a restaurant. I didn't, couldn't see the restaurant, but I heard laughter from the restaurant. And I took her, I always carry this little thing with me. Yes. And I took it out and wrote that poem about, I was thinking of the laughter in the restaurant. There's nothing wrong with natural laughter. Yes. But there is something to be distinguished between natural laughter and social laughter, you know. Um, and I thought of that laughter, and then I thought of the dead in Iraq. That's exactly what I thought. And I, My clue was severed head. That's it. Well, you're very sharp on the nail here. <laughs> um, so, how is your help? Oh, well, it's... Um, you were almost dead, and now you seem to be very alive. Thank you. I'm much stronger and m much better. It's an ongoing battle. Yeah, I, but I've come through has some wonderful medical um, practitioners, you know, who really brought me through. Have you learned anything about yourself? Yeah, that it ain't nice to be dead. <laughs> That's what I learned. Too. <laughs> Thank you. So great to see you. Good health and long life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Harold Pinter, Nobel laureate from the Old Vic stage in London, England, where he has had incredible success. Actors coming to uh, reflect on who they are and truth and uh, alienation and so many other human feelings. My thanks to Harold Pinter and the people at the Old Big Theater, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.